Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Exotic Astrology. We are with Lars again and we are discussing from Hellenistic Astrology and some other techniques by which we can time relationships for men and women and how we see sun and moon for uh, judging what kind of partners they can meet and if you have not watched the part one then please watch it. This is the part two. So yes, please carry on. Okay, great. Thanks again for having me here. Um, so yeah, in the, in the last video, we talked about sort of the very basic overview of this technique. And of course we, you know, well, I crammed in a bunch of extra stuff because it's always, uh, it always sort of takes you on a wild ride. You know, you get into one technique and then you got to talk about 10 more or whatever, like the aspects, but, um, a cup, like one thing I realized, uh, at the outset of this video that I, I forgot to mention is, you know, I had talked about the, um, the oriental and occidental positions of the the five planets which is oriental if they're rising before the sun appearing in the the de the the dawn and then occidental if they're setting um or if they're sorry rising after the sun rises and thereby appearing in the the dusk or the evening um and that's one way to determine whether or not the person is likely to get into that relationship that that planet might signify earlier or later in life. But Ptolemy also gives another fairly important but simple technique. And it's called, um, it's called the same thing actually. It's called Oriental and Occidental, but this time in the world, meaning that we use the houses to determine it. We use the quadrants. These are the quadrants, the four quadrants of the birth chart. And so basically speaking, the quadrants that are oriental, which means that the marriage will happen earlier in life, are going to be houses 12, 11, and 10. And the houses opposite, the, opposite those, so houses 6, 5, and 4. But I think what's important is that we have to we have to sometimes divide it a little differently because it's more based on the horizon and then what's called the midheaven IC axis, which is, uh, is something that I don't really see used as much in um, Indian astrology, in Jyotish a lot. Uh, but, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong on any of that stuff. Um, it's used more. It's it's used a lot in Hellenistic astrology, and what that is is that the the midheaven, which bisects the horizon in the astrology chart, and you'll see this in Western charts a lot, like the round charts. That is just the point. That's the noon point. That's the point where the sun, as like, is going to reach its apex in its hemicycle as it you know rises and sets, and so that point is really powerful because it represents a turning point, right where the where the sun gets to the, its most powerful position and then begins to sort of decline, right, towards the night and whatnot. And it's part of why uh, in Ayurvedic medicine, you know, they'll tell you that the Agni, the, the fire that helps you digest things, that's kind of, you know, in your solar plexus belly area, is most powerful naturally during the day between roughly maybe like 11 and one or 11 and two, something like that, because that, that is the time where the sun is like, it's most high in the sky in terms of its journey. So if we divide the four quadrants based on that, instead of just the houses, sometimes the midheaven will fall in like the ninth house or the 11th house. It won't be in the 10th house. And so in my opinion, it's, it's important to, to divide the quadrants based on that, um, that cross that happens. And so when I say houses 12, 11, and 10, that's the ideal, but that's not always the reality in the chart. However, you know, if you don't know how to use the midheaven or calculate it, which you can do for free on like astro.com, it'll show up in your calculation. Um, you can just use 12, 11, and 10, like I was saying, and 6, 5, 4. You can just start doing that. It's fine. Um, and then, of course, the other two quadrants are occidental, meaning that they, they signify things later in life. So um, that'll be houses one, two, three, and then seven, eight, nine. And again, this is, this is a general sort of broad technique that can help refine other ways of determining the general time period. And when I say earlier in life or later in life, right, that is totally relative to the culture as well. You know, like it's going to be way different in India than it is in America because 
you know, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, please. Uh, but it seems like in India, you know, an early marriage would be what more like, uh, late teens, early twenties. Early marriage. Now you can say maybe for a boy, it can be 23, 24. And for a girl, maybe 20, 21. That's early, but that's early. Okay. Yeah, it's going around like 24. I, I rarely hear some boy who says I got married at 22. Or okay. Like that. So maybe for females, if you take it's around 20, 21, I, but that's very rare. So 22, 23 is general, I guess. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it's really going to depend on the time and place. Um, yeah, and you know, uh, it's sorry to say 22, 23 is the normal on the earlier side. It's not normal. Like normally they get married around 25, 26 these days. But if you're asking early, right. then it's around 22, 23. Right. If it's early or earlier, like, you know, if you have um, some of the example charts I have are, are in my mind are interesting because um, like, like the chart I mentioned in the last video, this, this person, you know, they had exalted Saturn in the third house and that, that would mean you'd think that would mean like a later marriage or not, or not later, but a delayed marriage or something. Right. But the thing is, is that marriage that Saturn is Oriental and Saturn, you know, well, he's exalted and he does well in the third naturally because it's that, you know, that general rule. But the thing is, is he's also with a very important uh, lot or Saham that we call the lot of fortune in the Hellenistic tradition, which is like the second most important point, next to the ascendant in that particular tradition. So when a planet is with the lot of fortune or in a, a, an angle, like a kendra from it, it, um, it, its power increases even if it's otherwise cadent and whatnot. So there, there are always kind of factors to weigh about that. And that person married when they were 16. So that's quite young, you know, and that's, the, you know, that's in my country. So that's like insanely young. And this was, you know, many, many, many years ago, of course, different times. But um, whereas like my mom's chart shows um, a mixture of early and late marriage factors, but then she was married, I think around 27, right? So for here, and that, you know, as many years ago as it was, that's kind of, that's kind of like, um, it's neither early or late per se. It's, it's, you know, it's not, but I would say, you know, like it, probably these days, it's like the easiest way to think about it is like on the earlier side is going to be before the first Saturn return. And on the later side is probably going to be after that first Saturn return. And I can't say that this technique is just going to like work a hundred percent of the time, like super simply because like I said, you have to like mix the factors and sort of feel out intuitively, like which it's more likely to be till you get a hit, you know, and, and, and this is where the intuition is so important in astrology because, you know, we can do all these calculations and we can do like these, these pointing systems, right? You know, like something like Shad Bala or something similar to that. We can do these advanced pointing systems and get an idea based on mathematics. But if we don't, if we're not able to like feel into it, our judgment could still be completely wrong. <laughs> that's, at least that's been my experience. So I don't rely as heavily on the pointing systems, but it's like another, another thing to look at, right. Is, um, you know, the angular houses are the most powerful, you know, and it's even like this in, um, pr Prashara, right. Where, when he's talking about, um, Shad Bala calculations, the angular houses are the most powerful. Then, the succeeding houses, right? Two, eight, um, five, and 11. Those are about half as powerful. And then the cadent houses, the remaining four houses are about 25% as powerful. So that's where you, you got to like blend all these things of oriental, occidental relative to the sun, relative to the quadrants, like I just explained. And then, it, you know, is, if, it's in a, if it's in a cadent house, right? It can be slower because cadent houses are falling, they're falling away from the horizon or from that midheaven. They've already risen, so they're falling back. And so that's part of why um, they're weaker, uh, whereas the angles are right on it, and then the succedents are about to rise. They're about to rise over those angles. So um, I like to think of traffic, a traffic analogy. It's like the kendras are like a green light, 
you just going fast, you know, you can just cruise right through the, um, the succeed in houses are like a yellow light where you got to like speed up to get through the light. And, um, the, uh, the Caden houses are like a red light where you're stopped, you know, and you just got to wait or you could break the law and go, you know, that would be like a sixth, uh, 12th or maybe third house thing to do. It's like you break the law. So you get into some trouble if there's a cop there or whatever, but the traffic analogy works really well. And so for, for broad timing purposes, we're, we're kind of looking at a lot of stuff and, um, and then, you know, we're, we're getting, we're getting the planets from, um, we're getting the relationships from the planets aspecting the sun or the moon, depending on if it's a husband or a wife that we're looking for the, for the person. But then of course, you know, you have to examine the seventh house and its Lord and the planets in it. And then of course, Venus, Venus is going to be super important for marriage because if Venus is not in good condition, then it can either make the marriage very miserable and unstable, or it can, or it can negate the marriage too, as well. Um, you know, Saturn is Saturn as well, and, and Mars too. Like when those planets are not in a constructive aspect with the sun or the moon, which would be the trine or the sextile, right? Unless there's reception, meaning that the sun or the moon is in a sign ruled by Mars or Saturn then typically those are relationships that are going to be more problematic and have a harder time working out and stuff, you know, and the same for aspects to Venus because Venus isn't necessarily going to show the specific partner, but it'll show things about the marriage. It'll show, you know, how fulfilling the marriage is, um, especially in terms of like love and mutual acceptance and harmony and also the sexual um, nature of the marriage as well. So when the malefics are in a difficult aspect with Venus and there is no reception, it can, it can affect all your relationships. You know, it can, it can affect the whole spectrum of marriage and relationship, which means that even if you've got some really nice aspects to like the moon, let's say we're in a man's chart, you've got some nice aspects to that moon. If you have Venus afflicted, then it will delay or cause instability to whatever relationships you do have signified by the planets aspecting the moon. <laughs> right. And same with the same with the seventh Lord in the seventh house to, to certain degrees and, you know, slightly subtle and different varying degrees, of course, because, um, you know, there are, there are subtle differences like Venus refers because Venus refers primarily to beauty and harmony and like value and love and stuff like that. Right. That's, that's more what we're going to get from Venus, but the seventh house and the seventh Lord refers broadly to like all of our relationships, like whether it's an opponent, right. In like a race or a fencing match or something like that. Um, or it is a business partner, right? Or it is a marriage partner, romantic partner. So the seventh house is, is always how we're, how we're projecting ourselves onto the world. And also because of that, how we're being reflected by other people. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. And you can, you can experience this directly if you just sit with any person and stare directly into their eyes, right? That's seventh house. That's seventh first. That's very intense, right? And it doesn't, necessarily have to be romantic or sexual either a really good friend can also be represented by the seventh house sometimes if it's that type of powerful relationship even if it's just a friendship so when we look at uh when we look at the seventh lord and the seventh house in juxtaposition to like venus and the luminaries for marriage you know we're dealing with we're just dealing with something slightly and subtly different. If the seventh Lord and seventh house are really strong and in good condition, right? But Venus is not in good condition, then the person may very well get married, right? But how, how good is their married life? Is there love? Is there a healthy sexual relationship? Probably not, you know? So when we're, when we're timing and we're getting from the broad to the specific, we can use these other factors to determine these various spectrums of married life. And so we, we basically want to look at all of them 
and see if more of them are in good good condition or um, or bad condition to to find out is the person actually going to likely to be married? You know, is the person likely to be um, in any kind of major relationships, or are they going to be? Um, you know, like, like Pope Francis is, is a good example, right? The, the man's never been married, but if you read about him, he had, he, he talks about how right before he went, either right before he went into the church or right after he went into the church, he had like a crush on some woman he met, you know, and it was sort of like, okay, am I going to be married to the church or am I going to be married to this woman? And of course, Pope Francis's chart um, at least from a tropical perspective, because that's what I'm more familiar with in this case, uh, his seventh house at first glance looks good because it has um, Jupiter in Parivartana Yoga with Saturn in the ninth, and Jupiter's ruling the ninth, and, but Jupiter's fallen and with Mercury, and Jupiter and Mercury are malef fairly malefic lords for, um, for a, uh, or at least partially malefic lords for a Cancer ascendant, right? So, he had, you know, he has factors. He has Venus in the eighth too, in a Saturn sign, right? So he has factors that signify that he would be unlikely to get married, in in the traditional sense, right? And that's mostly if you look at the seventh house and then extend that to Venus and things like that. But he does have, you know, Venus sitting with the Moon, so maybe that's that girl he was interested in that one time that he never married. You know, it, it could be something like that. So that's um yeah that's kind of some more stuff on this subject did you want to say anything yeah that venus moon thing is very true with him because whenever i see his speeches and he's very soft and he's very feminine you know that yeah is there. <laughs> yeah but definitely I also, uh, I also heard about this then and I, as far as i remember i think that lady also appeared later on and the okay. media was like, oh, yeah, this lady. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. I, I don't know, but somewhere I saw an article or a video that it was this lady where with whom he was in that you know, junction, should I go this side or that side? So, yes, wow. that's weird. And uh, now, regarding Venus, as you said, so that's like uh, a general perspective which you are giving that if Venus is afflicted or it's badly placed. Yeah. Then even if suppose in a man's chart, moon is conjunct with Jupiter or aspected by Jupiter, then the relationship can be there, but yes, difficult. Right, but but difficulties, and and that's where um that's where we as astrologers can be better at prescribing remedies or doing counseling, right? Because we can look at the the problem with the marriage may not be either individual alone if the planets signifying them are in good condition but if venus were in not so great condition then that's where you look and say oh okay so really this is about the the actual like harmony or disharmony within the relationship and and maybe it has something to do with sexuality and stuff um there's there's a whole um so in in um in Hellenistic and Persian astrology, like they're not, they don't, they don't use the word yogas like in um, Jyotish, but th they have the same kinds of things. They have like tons and tons of yogas, basically just, you know, um, factors of planets joining together by this or that aspect in this or that way that give rise to certain situations. And the yogas that are given in some of these books regarding like, marriage and sex life with venus are remarkably accurate <laughs> just just remarkably accurate it's it's amazing like um you know a, a simple one is like if saturn is like square opposition to venus then it can mean that the spouse is um not going to be as uh as sexual or that they like are incapable of having sex i had one one person's chart they married this person who is an alcoholic and impotent. Yeah, and I was about to say that. Word. Very frustrating sexually. And this person had Saturn retrograde in the 12th in Virgo in a very close square aspect to Venus in Gemini in the 9th. And Gemini is also, Gemini is a very sexual sign, especially according to Yavana Jataka, but it's also a barren sign, which means you know, usually we look at that for children, but I think it also can show not being fulfilled sexually 
sometimes as well. And so there are some other subtle techniques here that, that we can bring into account, like the fact that Venus is earlier in the signs than Saturn, even though they're in that aspect, makes Venus um, kind of in some ways like calling more of the shots. And so the person whose chart this was, was a very, like was a person who really wanted to have sex, you know, with their, their husband, they were very sexual, right? So they wanted to do it, but every time, right, Venus is earlier. So it's like every time Venus goes, it, it bumps into Saturn and the alcoholism and the impotence that followed that, you know? And of course there are other problematic factors in the chart um, regarding that, uh, you know, the difficulty with the husband, there's like an eighth, eighth house sun conjunct Mars very closely, for example. In the lady both, chart? Yeah, both ruling the seventh house. Oh. Um, so not very, not very good for the husband, right? As, as represented by the sun and represented by the seventh Lord Mars, not a very good condition to be in. And so we, we see that he's, he has problems himself, right? But then also within the context of the marriage, some of those problems are sexual because of Venus's condition. Whereas let's say maybe Venus, uh, if Venus wasn't aspected by Saturn, but it was that same combination, you know, maybe, maybe there would be a lot of sex, but maybe the, the person would ha have different problems with that eighth house placement. You know, maybe the husband would have been more villainous or deceitful or something like, I mean, he was kind of deceitful anyway, but you, you get what I'm saying, right? Like, it's like, sort of like we look at all these things to see how it's all going to play out and be modified. And it's not just this one dimensional thing of like, get married or don't get married. And that's why I'm always kind of hesitant to predict marriage because a lot of the charts I get are difficult for marriage. And so it's like, well, I could find when you might marry the person that you're imagining, but that's not going to necessarily bring you happiness or solve your problems. And whether it balances your karmas or not is even a whole nother topic, you know? So yeah. a, a lot to take into account there, really. Yeah, so in the next section uh, after this video, maybe we can uh, see how to time that or is there any way? We yes, can let's do that. And and I'll also talk about the, the lots briefly as well. Yes. Those are helpful too. So we can talk about that and then timing, more specific timing. Okay, all right. So everybody stay tuned. This is part two. If you have not watched part one, then please watch. And we are going for part three now. Okay, bye.